In this video, we're going to be taking a look at batch normalization. So batch normalization is used to stabilize and potentially accelerate the learning process. It does so by applying a transformation that maintains the mean activation close to zero and the activation standard deviation close to one. And we're going to get into what that means in a second. So in order to understand what it's doing, it's important that you grasp what's back propagation. And so at a high level, back, back propagation is what will modify the weights in order to minimize your loss function. And to make this as simple as possible, let's assume that we have a neural network of two layers and each layer contains only a single neuron. And so we have the first layer here, L minus one, and then we have the last layer L. We can express the output of each neuron using the following formula. And so recall how the output of a neuron, which we're going to call A to the L minus one here, is multiplied by the weight along that edge. And then we're gonna go ahead and add a bias. And we take all this and then we pass it through sigma, sigma meaning a activation function. Sorry about that. All right, so a typical example of a cost function is the mean squared error. And I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen it, but essentially you can imagine a plot with a bunch of dots and then you want to figure out the best fitting line and that line the distance from all the different data points in that line squared is the mean squared error and so we want this to be as small as possible and so essentially our predicted value is going to be the output of the neuron passed through the activation function and then we compare that to the actual labeled value right because this is supervised supervised learning and we have access to that and so if we plotted the cost function in relation to the weight we would get something like this, where there is an optimal weight that minimizes the cost function. So in the case of a very basic two-dimensional model, the weight would be the slope of the line. And you can imagine that there's an ideal slope that will fit the data the best and thus minimize the mean squared error. And so, in order to figure out the derivative of the cost function with respect to the weights, we use the chain rule in calculus. So it's the partial derivative of z. z in this case is the output before the activation function with respect to the weight multiplied by the uh, output through the activation function with respect to z and then the partial derivative of the cost function with respect to the output of the neuron through the activation function. And we have the partial derivative derivatives, what they end up equaling is this right here. And the important thing here is right here. So we take the derivative of sigma, which is the activation function. And so if we take a look here, let's say that we were using the sigmoid activation function. 
Well, far from zero, it kind of plateaus off. And if we take the derivative of that, well, then the slope will be zero. Sorry, the, the slope is zero, and so the derivative would be zero. And the same thing if the value was much greater than zero. And so there's this ideal range close to zero, which we get non-zero values for the derivative. And this is important because if this right here, the derivative of the activation function is zero, well then this whole thing is zero. And this is also called the vanishing gradient problem. And so as it propagates backwards, it will end up calculating this multiple times. And if it's multiplying it by a very small number, um, then our model is no longer minimizing the loss function. It hardly changes throughout the different uh, epochs. And so what we can do is we can normalize the data. And recall how normalizing means that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And so if we do that, it will stay within this band right here, which is close to zero, and it doesn't go any further out than one. So I kind of explained uh, normalization quickly there. Let's go, let's review it in a bit more depth for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So this is your basic normal distribution. So we have our mean here and the vast majority of the samples fall um, close to the mean. And then the standard deviation is the width you could say. So how far away you are from the mean. Um, standard deviation, for those who aren't too familiar with it, is the square root of the variance. And so here's an image right here. So if there's a small standard deviation, then your curve um, will be very narrow, whereas if there's a large standard deviation, then it will be wide. And we can uh, compute, um, or we can normalize our data by subtracting the mean and then dividing by the standard deviation. And so no matter what your values are after applying this function right here, the mean will be zero and the standard deviation will be equal to one. And so batch normalization is essentially you normalize your data at every hidden layer. And so let's say that we had a grayscale image. The grayscale image, the pixels in the grayscale image would vary in intensity from zero to 255, right? And essentially, if that ends up going through a sigmoid function, then all the values other than zero, right? So 255 and so on would have a derivative of zero or near zero. And so in normalizing that, now the pixels only range from zero to one, and then we'll get the proper value here, or we won't have the vanishing gradient problem. And so that's enough background information. Let's take a look at an example. So we're going to go ahead and import the following libraries. And for this example, we're going to be using the SIFAR dataset. And essentially, it contains 60,000 images, which are 32 by 32 pixels wide. And they're divided into 10 classes. And so we have airplanes, automobiles, birds, cats, deer, dogs, frogs, horses, ships, and trucks. And uh, fortunately, the Keras library makes it really simple for us to import that into our program. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And then again, we're going to normalize the data right off the bat 
and that's going to achieve the same thing. And then we use the two categorical because we want to encode our data such that our model doesn't think that one image has a higher priority than another just because its integer value is higher. Next, we're going to be using the image data generator function from Keras, and that allows us to apply transformations to our images that allow our model to generalize. And so shear, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is like a shift. And then we have the zoom range, so it's going to zoom in or out of the image. And then we also have the horizontal flip. And this will force our model to learn the underlying patterns of an image as opposed to just memorizing the image itself. So we'll go ahead and run all this stuff. Um, for the number of steps, I just used this function, but really you could pick whatever number of steps you wanted. So we're gonna use uh, 781 steps. And so what we're gonna do first is we're going to build a model without batch normalization and then we're going to compare it with one where we use batch normalization. Excuse me. And um, just to make things simpler, we're go we'll use our testing data for the validation set because that way it will be used in our graph. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and I'm going to pause the video and then come back when it's done. And we're back, so let's take a look at what it looks like. And so we can see here that our validation loss decreased as we trained the model, as well as our training loss. And then if we take a look here, our validation accuracy didn't really change at all throughout the training process. And then the training accuracy was a bit sporadic. And so now let's go ahead and do the same thing, but this time we are going to create a, or we're gonna use a batch normalization layer. And again, I'm gonna pause the video and then come back when this is done. And we're back. So let's take a look at the validation and training accuracy. So as you can see, the training loss now decreased slightly every single epoch. And the training accuracy, more or less the same thing. So every epoch, it increased slightly. And as you can see, our validation accuracy now actually changed whereas before there was no difference whatsoever. In conclusion, batch normalization helps prevent the vanishing gradient problem by normalizing the data such that it ranges from 0 to 1 before it enters the activation function. So thank you for watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments.